Hey guys, Luton here, welcome back for some more Below the Line. Now this is the series where I discuss a topic, you leave your comments down below and then in the following video next week we'll discuss some of those best comments. Continuing the format now where I discuss a topic first and then we come to the comments from the previous week. Now in this week's Below the Line I'm asking, are straight up reskins ever okay? So with two upcoming hospital sims, Project Hospital and Two Point Hospital, this is a perfect example to take on. One is a straight up reskin of a 90s beloved classic. The other has its own style and much more detailed direction. Both have found an audience, but I was surprised personally by how much praise and excitement there has been around Two Point Hospital, which is looking to be the straight up reskin of Theme Hospital. Now new more live gameplay has showed this off and it does look just like a theme hospital 2.0 and I'm sure for some people that will be all they want from the game. But thinking of how often gamers decry games as just a reskin with all the negative tones that it implies, often I found myself having conversations with people where we both agreed all you actually needed to do was update the game a little bit because the base game was essentially right the first time. So sometimes, yeah, people are happy with just a reskin, that's all they want. This leads me to almost a second question here. Should devs sometimes just leave well enough alone? Is it necessary that every time a successor or spiritual successor comes along, it's got to reinvent the wheel? We often have games like, let's say, Civ, that have found an iteration that was immensely popular. Civ 5 is that case in point, an incredibly popular game even now, many years after release. But the devs for some reason decided actually, no, that's not it, and they created Civ 6, which has had a lukewarm reception at best. Take a look at something else like Dawn of War. Relic thought they wanted a winner with Dawn of War 3, bringing in refreshed concepts and blending moberish elements. And I thought as well the game was a step away, but it brought enough new elements as to be just as interesting as previous iterations, Dawn of War 2 was quite a step out from Dawn of War 1, so it just seemed sensible to me that okay they've decided to go in a slightly different direction this time, but once you spent some time with that game you could really start to see that it actually worked against the mechanics that made the previous games work and people lashed back against that, it wasn't what they wanted in a game, they wanted the core functionality of those previous games. Which really begs the question, are we actually better off sometimes with just a straight up reskin? A standalone huge DLC, in essence. Devs do seem to be braver these days, especially in the indie sphere, so I'd love to see at some point devs just stand up and say, you know what, we got it right the first time, we're confident in that product, so we're just giving people what they want, and if it's not broke, don't fix it. As much as moving forward and innovating and trying to improve on the original, it's always a good thing and obviously you always want to be doing that. But I think sometimes it's true that game devs are actually making changes and going in different directions more for themselves than their actual communities. Or even maybe just convincing themselves like, hey yeah, this is the right way to go, kind of rationalising it for themselves. You might think, well, LT, that, that's a bit harsh. That's a bit of a harsh, you know, generalisation to make and a jump to make. And I'd say, yeah, fair enough, I'd agree. If it weren't for the fact that over the years I've spoken with devs who specifically said that they just didn't want to churn out another version of the same game they'd already worked on, they wanted to do something new. Which is understandable, but it doesn't necessarily equate to giving the community and the audience actually what they want. Games are obviously a creative medium, and that's exactly the thing. Often these changes that come in sequels are not happening because that they think it's what the players want, it's because it's what the devs want to do to try new things, to maybe see if they can't make it just a little bit better. And it's not exclusive to games either, think of anything in media, be it TV shows, movies, the catalogues are littered with amazing films and shows which then went on, often with the same production teams, to create absolutely unwatchable sequels that can even damage and then further undermine the previously applauded successes. And the same is true for games. Instead of sometimes just standing back and admiring their work and going, do you know what, we got this one, bang on. Developers can't stop pissing about with things and they end up making it a whole lot worse. It's really hard to judge, but I'd love to see a game company understand that they got it right the first time and release sequels with minor tweaks that could be then retroactively patched out if it turned out to be kind of an unsuccessful change that people really didn't want. So today's question, are pure reskins ever okay? Which game would you love to see brought up to date 
but with minor, if any, tweakage. Tell me down below in the comments, guys. So now we come to part two of Below the Line, and last week we were discussing do games like Squad, which are bringing in some fundamentally straightforward but ultimately constructive mechanics into their games, have the potential to influence things like Battlefield AAA titles, which have been quite lacking in their, I guess, mechanics which can actually influence constructive gameplay. Something like the team leader communication system in Squad would be put in Battlefield, it could fundamentally assist that game in becoming overall more constructive and perhaps helping the player base to get together. One of the things in Squad is that it encourages people to communicate, whereas Battlefield does nothing of the kind. In a larger sense we're also talking about indies and AAA titles and how indie games generally are going to have that kind of focused passion where they're happy to take a risk and put something out there just because it's how they want it to be whereas with a AAA title they tend to be thinking a lot more about the statistics of who's maybe playing those games they're thinking about you know hitting those sales target figures because that is very very important and you might say oh it's just very cynical LT and it's like yeah, actually not, because I remember as my example that I always use is at the end of Battlefield 4 when they were talking about doing all those initiatives, testing out new things, and basically they had the team player initiative. At the end of the day, that just got dropped because they wanted to release map packs and guns because it was seen to be just what needed to happen, you know? So it's it's not actually just cynicism saying like, oh yeah, AAA titles, blah, blah, blah. No, it's, it's pretty demonstrable and demonstrable on a number of occasions. Okay, Rook comes in and says, I think a big reason for the lack of tactical gameplay and teamwork in Battlefield and other games is time to spawn. I think people tend to be more careless, throw away their lives, knowing that they're just going to spawn in 10 seconds, uh, versus a game like Squad, which forces you to wait more than a minute, which might not seem long, but it sure as hell feels like it, which tends to make people a lot more wary of their lives. And this is a pretty obvious point to make, but it's actually a really good point to make because it's true. It's very, very true. In Squad, you genuinely also feel the fear because you know that if you go down, you're going to be waiting to get back in. So you genuinely take a lot more care and it feels more terrifying. Whereas in a game where you just respawn, 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 you just kind of don't care either way. You don't care about the rounds that are coming in. You don't care if you die. It does take, make you take a lot more risks and just run out and think, yeah, whatever. Like if I go down, so be it. You know, whereas in Squad, you, you're really trying to stay alive and you you really have to check and care. Now here's the argument to make there. Obviously some games are not going for that. Some games are not trying to be that game. They're perhaps wanting that faster pace and that's the thing with something like Battlefield. You know they've tried for a long time to focus the direction of the gameplay towards uh, speed and you know f they always talk about the speed of the fastest Battlefield ever but in doing so yeah it gets a lot more action-packed but that action is so ready and so happening all the time, it's so frequent that it, you actually kind of get desensitized to it. You just don't care, and that's when it gets boring. And that was the difference between older games, older FPS games, and the newer ones. The newer ones, they just want all action all the time. And in doing so, by having so much action all the time, you actually kind of having no action, because just everything feels the same all the time. Whereas in more kind of simulation games like uh, Armour or Squad or something like this, or Postscriptum or perhaps Hell at Loose coming up, the, the game the game action is a lot more fragmented. You have you, yeah, you have long periods where there's not a lot going on. But then when stuff is going on, you think like, fuck my life, I've gotta get down on the floor, or I've gotta get you know, it, it's it, there's a lot more weight to what it is you're doing. Whereas in something like Battlefield or COD or any of these kind of more AAA arcade FPSs, you're just running around, you're like, yeah, yeah, bang, 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 whatever. You know, it's just, and it, it gets boring. That's what I hear from a lot of people. And that's why their player base is hemorrhage so hard. Because people play it for a little bit and they go, oh, this is kind of nice. Oh, uh, yeah, well, whatever, you know, it's, it's just, it gets boring. It's as simple as that. And you wouldn't think something could be boring from so much going on and so many explosions, but it is because, you know, like, like any kind of blockbuster action movie, as explosive and exciting as it can be, at the same time, you just sit there going, oh, yeah, look, look, that truck blew up. You know, you're not sitting in the edge of your seat going, oh, my God, you know, it's, you're not. You're just sitting there going like, oh, yeah, look, that guy just killed like 20 people, you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Venom says, Insurgency is a great game, it's got a mix between hardcore and casual mechanics. So I've heard a few people say it's actually, it kind of walks the line between something like Squad and something like um, Battlefield or whatever. He says, it does a nice job immersing you into its world without all the glitter and gimmicks that COD or Battlefield uses. You actually have a choice between weapons and gear uh, within whichever class you pick that doesn't require you to get X amount of XP or assignment with ridiculous objectives. You can choose whether or not you want to do the tutorial. Um, new weapons and gadgets are unlocked without any progression when they release. Free DLC with new 
maps and actual night maps where you're forced to either use night vision or flashlights. All of this for $10. Uh, AAA titles will charge between $60 to $120 based on the edition you buy and whether or not it guarantees a DLC pack or weapon skins. I think that's why so many people are starting to stray away from the big titles. Uh, will it change anything? No, not really. Is it possible to change the industry? I do believe so. By thinking with our wallets and doing a little bit of research before dropping a decent amount of cash on the next big thing, I personally keep my distance from hype trains, very sensible, uh, coming from a person who nearly shot himself when he saw the Metro Exodus trailer, and that does look very nice. Uh, many devs and publishers, I've also heard a lot of people saying they want to play more single player games because they're sick to death of toxic trolling BS in multiplayer. It's gotten so bad and so much hacking and cheating and so on and so on. A lot of people that seem to be stepping back from multiplayer at least into kind of closed communities rather than just big open stuff. And that's really sad. So many devs and publishers focus in on that cash grab as soon as they drop the first trailer. That's where they get lost and caught up with their greed. They lose focus on the consumer and the community. That is 100% correct. So yes, thank you LT for bringing up the topic. Keep up the good work. Okay, Demon Grenade says, all right, here's what squad gets right. Easy to hop in and play without hassle. As a person who comes from the armor community, and I know I'm not the only one, it's incredibly refreshing to have a game in the same vein as armor that doesn't require downloading a shitload of mods. Yes, thank Christ. Uh, configuring servers, settings, and all that tedious nonsense just to get the game to work. With Squad, I can hop in on any server and get the tactical experience I want. Yes, I mean, this is what I said the other day about Armor 4. The biggest issue with armor is that it's a pain in the ass on the back end. You know, it's, it's not about just the gameplay and its lagginess and its bad frame rate. It's about the fact that it's just this colossal pain in the ass just to get it all up and running and working with your friends you want to play. With Squad or something like this, you can just jump in and play. That's what you want. With armor, it's really a flip of a coin as to whether or not you're even going to be able to join a server, let alone get any form of competent tactical gameplay when you're inside that server. You might have to go download some mods, tweak those mods before you actually get into the server. If you get in the server, armor can always decide that it's not going to run well today, or it's just going to bug out, or it's going to get armored for some reason. The game's so inherently buggy that there's a community-wide term to describe when it happens. And while, yes, it adds to the charm of the game, it's often more just incredibly annoying. And yeah, I think we all feel that. So secondly, what does squad get right? Again, in comparison to armor, it's a fairly light on simulation mechanics, and in my opinion, that's a good thing. For example, squad's ballistics model is quite straightforward. It's simple. When you fire a shot, it will drop over distance and can penetrate stuff, but the bullets aren't rendered until they stop moving, unlike armor. In squad, bullets stop being rendered after set conditions are met. So for example, bullets never ricochet. While in armor, bullets will always be rendered until they either stop moving or embed themselves in an object. You can see this if you enable the bullet trails in a single player mission, when the bullet trails turn white it can't do damage but armor still tracks its trajectory anyway this unnecessarily eats up performance it also leads to unrealistic bullet behavior because if a bullet can't embed itself in an object it will always ricochet where a real bullet would just shatter you can see this in the firing range if you manage to hit the weapon in the target's hands. I can go on and on about this topic, but you get the point. Squad ditches all unnecessary simulation mechanics that don't actually enhance the gameplay. Third, it's actually easy to learn, squad that is. Very self-explanatory, go play it, go play armor. Notice the difference in how easy squad is to control in comparison. And that's basically it. Squad's main problem comes from the bad apples in the community, mainly armor milsim guys who take the game way too seriously. And not that all armor milsims are like that, but there are a few. But here's the thing with Squad, at the same time you can be chilled about it, but you do still need to pay attention to what you're doing, you do have to work with other people and communicate, because if you don't do that, then you're obviously going to get punished for it at the same time. So there is something to be said for taking the game seriously. At the same time, it's good to just jump in and have some fun. That fun doesn't necessarily need to be the level of milsim. I quite honestly think also Milsim because it's such a niche thing it really should be just kept to kind of private servers if people want to have that kind of thing then they can have that but it's just for the large part it's just not something that's like publicly very consumable. Mr. Lesson Dave says Squad to me feels like one of the few games out there that was made by a group of guys who created something they wanted to play rather than profit from. They throw all the AAA building blocks out the window and it is all the better for it. There's no back slapping for getting kills, no flashy pop up of you were killed by insert whatever someone's name and the core gameplay is genuinely challenging to the point where lone wolf players don't last long. It's even entertaining when they turn up on a free weekend and the aforementioned comm system lets you hear them have a full on meltdown at the lack of knife kills etc. 
Teamwork is so integral to the gameplay that I go so far as to describe it as a cooperative shooter rather than a competitive one. It's almost irrelevant that you're playing against players and not AI, as no attention is drawn to that fact at all. This really lends focus to playing the objective rather than team rivalry, and it's so refreshing that the game is designed this way rather than teamwork being used as a marketing punchline like in so many other games. So that's actually a really interesting point, and I hadn't thought of that even at all, and I think it's absolutely correct. He says it's familiar because all the mechanics you expect are there, but the spirit and ethos and mentality of the gameplay doesn't really exist in other games. And that's also true, and that's also a sad thing. He also says, hashtag down with scampy fries, playing with fire, fire. Mr. Nangle says, I'm by no means a veteran of Squad, I've only played 36 hours so far after the past month or so, and I haven't dabbled into Squad lead yet. But the reason I find Squad so good is, there's no progression system, there's no need to be top of the scoreboard, there's no unlocks or achievements. There's not a single gimmick that will put off the modern brainwashed gamer, as most of these so-called gamers need progression to feel like the game's worth playing. The magic of Squad, as I said, is it has none of that, and yet it's massively captivating. Squad isn't about kills, it's not about winning. For me, it's about the experience, the journey, how you make it to the end, and not necessarily the end goal. And that's a very laudable perspective. With modern games like Battlefield, you play to progress, to unlock new stuff, and people complained about Battlefield 1 not having enough content. What does that say? It states the gameplay isn't good enough to keep people interested. Squad is raw gameplay and dynamic experiences that are so unique every time you play. I've never seen a community of players come together to actually play as a team. It is amazing. For people who think it'll be too hard, I can tell you, I'm no veteran of any shooter, I'm just your average Joe, and yet I managed to have some amazing games. I've seen new players join squads and have fun, there's noob-friendly servers to help people get a grip with it, and most of the time the community is nice, a lot nicer than a lot of online games anyhow, but your experience may vary over 36 hours. I think I've only been team killed about 8 times, and as you can tell, I really enjoyed squad. I wish everybody the best who plays it. And also, can I just say, this is really why I enjoy doing this series, guys, why I enjoy doing Below the Line, because it is really good to hear people's actual, genuine feedback, because sometimes it's all very well having YouTube producers talk about games and all this kind of stuff, but when you're a person who plays games all the time, I really often feel like that's not someone giving their actual, genuine perspective, because gamers are not just... YouTubers. Gamers are people that jump, come home from work at the end of the day, you're tired, you want to jump on a game and play for 2-3 hours. It's not always about people that are playing 6 hours a day, you know, grinding a game in a day in, day out, and da 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 da, understand every single mechanic, understand all of the weapon damage models, understand this, understand that. It's, it's not about those kind of people. Gaming is about everybody, it might be someone who just chills on a Saturday with some gaming, you know, or goes around with friends and plays or, you know, whatever. It, it, it plays in one community with a bunch of his mates and that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And so, you know, you really want to get a rounded perspective. And this series, I always feel, helps with that so much because you guys can actually give me your thoughts and feedback. And you guys that watch me, I know, are a really broad spectrum of people from different places around the world. You all have like different things that you enjoy about the games and all this kind of stuff. So it's really kind of good to hear from people. And it's I, I really enjoy kind of looking through your feedback and um, picking out your selections. And, and often as well, it's really good for me because I get to actually hear and as I say, sometimes ideas and thoughts that I haven't thought of. And you think like, oh yeah, that, that is really true. I hadn't thought about that. So it's a really good thing. And just want to say, you know, cheers for you guys always commenting and getting involved. Okay, John Boyega says, I think a large amount of the reason why indie devs do a great job, as you alluded to in your previous video, is a willingness to take the risks, like I said at the start of today. When we look at the movement of successful indie shooters back to more hardcore mechanics and damage models to raise a kind of meaningfulness to the death, and actually staying alive more meaningful than just a KD, we saw a great deal of success, like calling in artillery to cover an advance for your team as an officer in Day of Infamy, innovation with things like insurgency at Day of Infamy growing off of each other with mechanical changes that impacted uh, the teamwork aspect and with AAA titles the changes in innovations are often less risky more gimmicky with things like Levolution in Battlefield 4 gas and the graphics for Battlefield 1 and many games uh, made to just simply look pretty and let's not even begin to mention jetpacks subsequent lack of jetpacks in COD it's almost as if AAA titles are made what do you, what do you mean almost as if AAA titles are made for 13 year olds to casually pick up and troll people with stupid emblems and remotes versus actual care for the state of the game resulting in ridiculously bland titles like Ghost Recon's Wildlands. Some people do like that. Drew likes that a lot but I, I don't know what's, what the deal is with it really. Uh, Battlefront 2, dear Jesus Christ, and uh, Need for Speed games. The disparity between so called hardcore fans and casual fans should be destroyed. There are plenty of indie shooters that have found mass 
player bases that were targeted at so-called hardcore gamers. If hardcore gamers are a demographic that demand excellence and innovation, then everyone should just be that. Protocol says excellent squad breakdown and AAA comparison. Unfortunately, AAA studios may be now too far down the rabbit hole to see their way out. If smaller indie studios can continue to get the support they deserve based on quality, we may see growth and a market shift. I'll continue to vote with my wallet and not support the AAA titles that have lost their way. Yeah, AAA titles are a weird thing. I'm going to be very, very interested to see what happens with Battlefield this year because they've had several games of Battlefield now which have just basically, like I say, hemorrhaged player bases. Yes, they've sold a ton of copies of the game. This is what people always go, they always say, oh, they sold a load of copies of the game, therefore it's a success. Yeah, technically it's a success from that point of view if you want to look at it that way. But overall, is it a success? I don't know, I don't think so. And yes, even though the games do still comparatively have quite a reasonably high you know, concurrent player base when you compare it to other things. It's more about like, look, yes, a game may have like a largest player base even after the drop off from release, but how severe is that drop off from release compared to other titles? That's the thing you should be looking at because, yeah, look, let's say, um, I, I can't think of numbers off the top of my head. Let's just say a game, right? Let's just say a AAA title is getting like 20,000 concurrent players at release, but then it drops to like 15,000, but then stays at 15,000 for most of the rest of the time. That's a drop off, but it's not really severe. But look at something like Battlefield, which I'm pretty sure if I do have the stats right in my head, at release it's having like something like 250,000 players online or something at some one time, I seem to recall, and then that drops, but then it drops to like 50,000 and below for the, that's like a massive drop off. That's a huge drop off, you know? And it's like, that's really where you wanna be looking. It's like how many people who purchased the game then continue to play that game? And that's what it should be telling you because yeah, it might have a big-ish audience comparatively to other titles, but if other titles are bringing in a player base and then retaining that player base, it's clearly doing a much better job of giving the player base for that game what they want. Whereas Battlefield sell a ton of copies and then literally bleed out after the first week or first month. That's not a good sign. That shows that the majority of people who purchase that title don't like the game. And that means that it's fundamentally failing in what it's supposed to be doing. And that is a big problem. And that is something that they should think about. And if they don't think about that, it means all they're thinking about is the initial sales and making the money back on that title. And that, for me, fundamentally, is not a particularly constructive thing, and it's quite ethically questionable. Okay, last one for today, and while both AAA titles and indies have their issues, I think the different issues are more telling and give the answer to your question, LT. Let's start with AAA. AAA very rarely like to take risks, and they like to keep things very much the same. They might make tiny changes, but overall things feel just the same. Look at COD and Battlefield. Both games are basically just the exact same as the previous ones, maybe with one change to the mechanics in a different setting. This is the reason you see very few brand new IPs. Most AAA games are just sequels to franchise games they've already released. AAA issues are usually concept based. They're greedy, they want money, they don't want to take any risks. They only make games they believe the gamers are buying right now. There was a time where AAA never touched horror games because nobody was buying them up until an indie horror game came out and then people bought it up. This is the failing of AAA. With indies, it's less of a concept and it's more about material. Namely, indies don't have enough money, they can have good concepts, they could have the want to just make a game to just make the game, or even make a game for the player base. But usually when an indie game fails, it's because they just didn't have enough money to pay for stuff. The one concept thing that fails as an indie dev is if the money gets into their head and they start trying to put more and more features into the game, but in adding more random features, never can get balanced or fixed and they eventually then just also run out of money. To me it's very telling because you don't see many AAA games getting released and people hyping over anything but the name that's attached to it. It's a new armor, it's a new COD, it's a new Mass Effect, but indies, most of them are praised for being very good games. Not because of their name, but because of their characters, their mechanics, and their concepts, and so on and so on. And it's true, I think that's where we ultimately come down to. And I think it's something everybody knows already, like indies have just got more heart to them. And that might be hard to hear for some people that are working on AAA titles, but ultimately that is the case for the reasons that Juro said right there. It's true, AAA games don't like to take risks. They generally sort of play the market and like, okay, what are people playing right now? Look what's happening this year. Battle Royale, PUBG, you know, PUBG has been very, very popular. It's done very well. So what are all the AAA titles going to do right now? It's Battle Royale year. It's exactly what I said in, you know, the start of this year. This year is going to be the year of Battle Royale. It's obvious. It's clear for anybody to see. And it's just 
kind of bullshit. You know, I know some people are really excited about Battle Royale and Battlefield because they think, okay, the frame rate and the stability and all these kind of things are going to be much, much better and da, 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 da. And it's like, yeah, that's true. It definitely has a big potential to be very, very good and interesting and so on and so on. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it is just yet again, AAA devs going, hmm, what can we do? What's popular right now? Oh, let's do this. Instead of coming up with a very unique, interesting concept that they think, hey, you know what? This is what's going to make our game really, really good. And you tell me, are they making Battle Royale in a lot of AAA titles? now because they think that's what their game needs that that's what's going to make their game really good or are they doing it because it's just the flavor of the year i think it's pretty clear what the reason is tell me your thoughts guys about our topic for this week where we're talking about reskins and is it ever okay to really just do a straight up reskin and be really blatant about it i think quite honestly yeah i think if people put their cards on the table and said you know what we did well with this and here's our next version of it it's just basically a big content update for you guys i think people would be pretty on board with that at the same time if you're going to do a genuine spiritual successor of a game i think you need to take on what was there and build onto it don't just literally lay down you know a graphical update because that honestly is kind of bullshit thanks for watching today as always guys look forward to your comments next week and i'll see you next time for some more below the line